are the everyday prayer books on page 48. And let's pray this together. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. A verse from Psalm 84. The Lord God is a sun and shield. He gives favour and honour. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your gifts of body and mind, for health and strength to work, for sunshine and rain, for life itself, and for all that exists to your praise. Open our eyes to recognize your undeserved goodness and fill our hearts with joyful obedience so that we may thank and praise you in word and deed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. I want to talk about the tradition of daily prayer in the church generally and then in our Lutheran church um, and then touching on the relevance of that for our devotional life. Let's see, that looks, is that about right? As we noted from the lecture, the lesson last, uh, uh, the last one, two days ago, was it? Yes, yep. Tuesday, yes. Um, the tradition of, of daily devotions goes back to the Old Testament. Um, and it's very, very strong. Just because it's not mentioned all that often doesn't mean, doesn't indicate the importance of it. Um, uh, you need to realize that uh, the people went down to the temple on average, say, twice or three times a year. It's a very rare experience. Synagogues came late in Israel's history. The piety of your people, the God's people, was formed around what Luther called the family altar, the family table, family devotions. And to the present day, if you want to understand the, the, the power, the spiritual power of the Jewish tradition and why it lasts against enormous odds, you need to see that that's the heart of it. The family altar. And if I can contrast something, if there's one thing that I reckon has been lost from not just the Lutheran church, but across all denominations... It's the family altar. And that accounts for, I think, a lot of the weakness of Christians and the weakness of the church. The church has always been strong when it's had two poles, the divine service 
the communion service on the one hand, and the family altar on the other hand. They belong together. If you lose one of them, the other one's weakened. The family altar, what's so significant about that? And uh, I want to just follow it through in the history of the church and leading up to Luther and then for uh, uh, the relevance for us today. Uh, and I, can I just say, I reckon the challenge is for you when you go out is to help people to re-establish it. What I find very sad is that I go to Christian families, meals, and they don't even say grace anymore. As elementary as that, the most elementary practice of piety, spirituality, is no longer there. Um, something is wrong here, and something's not going through, despite the best of efforts of people to try and revive this. Um, if there's one thing that I look back now, the, you know, the, the height of my years, what I can see, the thing that shaped me more than anything else wasn't what happened in church, but the tradition of family prayer led by my father and mother in the family. That's the heart of my heritage, yes? Would you please describe for me at some stage what a family altar looks like? I've never seen uh, look, it's not the term, it's not, it, it, don't be put up by the term family altar. You remember the altar is the table. Altar is the term, family altar was the term that Luther used for family devotions. So it could be the kitchen table. It's the kitchen table. As an expression, you know, you have two altars, um, uh, two tables. There's the Lord's table at the temple, and then there's the Lord's table around the, the family meals. Right, and that can be, then people can, can you know, sometimes have a little altar or have candles or have a crucifix. Um, but the important thing isn't the trappings. The important thing is the devotion, if I can use that term. Um, and some, something as sim, simple as saying grace uh, in connection with meals. Um, now, uh, I wanted to, to, to track this and to show you a few things leading up to Reformation and then uh, going to modern times. Did you have your hand up, by the way? This reminds yes. me of just, I watched that Ingmar Bergman film, Virgin Springs, yes. something like that, recently, yes. and, um, and it's just a sort of a Scandinavian yes. 14th century kind of setting, but they have a lovely example of the family altar. Yes. They all eat, some beggars come off the street, but they come in and eat together at yes. the table. They all have their feel, they're sharing it with other people, it yeah. finishes, and the, um, the husband sits there and then just leads devotion, all, all just from the mouth, no books or anything. No books, because it had not a book society. No book society, and, and everyone knows how to participate in. Yep. And it goes, and um, it's just a, it was just a lovely, it's a small clip, and it's just stuck with me, the picture. Because you actually, it's one thing to read about these things, but it's just lovely to actually see it or experience it in this in the riches of the of Which is, yeah, it's been developed. Right on up. Um, that's the issue that I want to deal with today. Okay, just to summarize the Old Testament. Now, what God, through Moses, gives his people to do is to say their confession of faith, the Shema, every morning, every evening. Now, it's very simple. I don't know whether it struck you um, when we went through it. I took quite a long time. There's two things about it. On the one hand, it's very simple. On the other hand, it's very profound. You see that the... the Thing. It's very easy to do, and yet it's very, very rich in what it does and what it accomplishes. Now, um, uh, uh, it was originally twice a day, morning and evening, but then by the time of Daniel, the post-exilic period, there was a tradition not just of praying two times a day, but three times a day. Um, Maria, could you open your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 6? Uh, read verse 11 to 13. Now, remember, Daniel is no longer present in the Holy Land of Israel. He's in, in Babylon. And as a pious Jew, uh, what does he do? This gives a snapshot into what was happening already hundreds of years before Daniel and what continues all the way through that post-exilic period. 
Uh, I could illustrate from material outside of the Old Testament, but this gives us one window into this from the Old Testament. Maria, could you read, please? Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. In verse 13. Verse 13. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to your decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Right, Daniel still prays three times a day, the window facing Jerusalem. Now, three times a day. Now, uh, 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 why three times a day? Well, uh, it's connected with the temple worship because you had the morning and evening sacrifice, but then in the middle of the day, you had personal offerings, personal sacrifices. So the public offerings were morning and evening, and between the midday, you could bring your own offerings to God, your own prayers to God. And so what pious people by that time did was to have uh, prayers and to say the Shema three times a day. Can you see? Morning, noon, and evening. Um, and already in the Old Testament times, and we don't know how early, but this was very um, uh, much the case in the Qumran community. Remember the Dead Sea Scrolls, Qumran community? Uh, had not just three times of prayer, but had seven uh, times of prayer in a day. This is community stuff. Not family stuff, but goes into community. Um, and you can see it uh, uh, already in Psalm 119, which is a very late psalm. Uh, could you please read that, uh, 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 Tom? Psalm 119, 164. Now, Psalm 119 talks about meditating on God's word, his law, morning, evening, night time. But notice this is one, uh, um, one part that goes beyond that. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous ordinances. Right. Notice that there are seven times a day. Now some scholars see, see this as being just a, uh, a figure of speech. Seven times means all the time. Now, because seven's a perfect number. But I think it's much more concrete. That seven times a day... Uh, there is a custom of praising God. Notice the uh, praise seven times a day. And don't think of it as terribly long. It might be just something that takes one or two minutes. Uh, seven times a day praising. Now this is going to be important for our Christian tradition or one aspect of the Christian tradition. So just take note of that. Now one of the things that surprises me um, and that scholars overlook is that Jesus was a person of prayer. Now, um, Luke's Gospel shows it to us. Before, at all the important stages of Jesus' life, from his baptism through to his last word on the cross, Jesus prayed. Um, it's worth reading Luke's Gospel just from that point of view. Um, just have a look now, please, Murray, at uh, one little snapshot of this in Luke chapter 5 verse 16 <clears throat> Luke 5 verse 16 but Jesus often, often withdrew to lonely places and prayed now um, the term that's used for often there is in uh, could also be translated as regularly often not just frequent in time but he had regular times of prayer. He'd go to a lonely place by himself in order to pray. There's another little interesting snapshot there. Um, uh, read that now, Murray, in the context of 15 through to 17 and see the point that Luke is making here by an interesting juxtaposition. Yes? Yet the news about him spread all the more, so the crowds of people came to, to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Ju Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. And then you get the account of the paralytic brought to Jesus. Now, 
Look the pro uh, observe the Kleinic principle here. What's odd about that juxtaposition of events? You have Jesus, the crowd's coming to hear and be healed. And he retreats. What? And he retreats. And then he retreats, and then one day he heals. And notice then that one day, uh, as he was teaching, um, the Pharisees came. Uh, he was sitting there, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. What's the point that Luke's making here? You get reference to Jesus teaching, healing, withdrawing to pray, and the power of the Lord being present with him to heal. He's teaching. What? Yeah? He gets um, his nourishment from the Lord through prayer. He gets nourishment from his heavenly Father through prayer. No? He's, yes, he's the meat in the sandwich. That he doesn't uh, his word that he speaks is not his own word. He gets the word from the Father. The spirit that he gives to people doesn't come from himself. It comes from the Father. The healing that he brings to people comes from the Father. But so it's in prayer that he receives the things from his heavenly Father that he then passes on in his ministry to his disciples. Now Luke's putting it there because for him this is a pattern, not just for Jesus, but it's also a pattern for us in ministry. Jesus prays regularly. Now what does, do you think Luke means by regularly? Let's have a look at the times that are mentioned. And I'll just take, I've gone all over the Gospels to show that, you know, this is not just Luke. Um, uh, Chris, can you read those uh, three passages? First of all, Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark 1, verse 35, if you don't mind. Um, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So Jesus gets up early in the morning to pray. Next passage. Um, Matthew, going back, 14.23. After the end of a busy day, what does Jesus do? After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside to pray, uh, by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. Okay, so he goes at the end of the day, mountainside. What does he do? To pray um, as evening comes. And then you remember his disciples go in a boat. And while they're on the boat, they're threatened by the storm. Jesus is on the mountain praying for them. But if you have to go to in this um, and other parts of the cars uh, uh, find very, very common. To read chapter Luke six verse twelve for me, please. One of those days Jesus went to a mountainside and prayed. He spent the night praying to God. What did he spend the night doing what? Praying to God. And this was before what event? Can you see what comes immediately after this? The calling of the twelve. This is so important that he doesn't just get up early in the morning or do it in the evening before going to sleep, but he spends the whole night in prayer. Now, the term for this, the technical term for this is a vigil. What does a vigil mean? It means staying awake for a period during the night and you get uh, either a short vigil during the night or a whole night vigil. Vigil. This is, you need to know this term. It's very, very important for our Christian tradition. Jesus spends the whole night in prayer. Now, Hans, uh, is it the case that in your church in India that say two or three times a year you have a congregational vigil? Um, it, it depends. Sometimes you have where the youth me, yes. Once or twice a year, and they have all night prayers. Yes. And, uh, okay, that custom. Now you find that in you came across that in Malaysia, oh, did you? I was talking to some Indian kids in Malaysia once, youth about 
prayer and we were just talking about when you do it and I said, oh, so you never get up at 2, 3, 4 in the morning to pray? I said, no. I said, oh, that's strange, you know. Like, yes. It's just the most odd, it was just completely normal for them to do that. It's very common with Lutherans in Malaysia. Now, the, many of the congregations that I know have four times a year they have a congregational vigil, not just the youth vigil, but the whole congregation meets in a place and they bring mattresses so that if get, somebody gets too tired and if the kids need to do it, they sleep there, but they spend the whole night in prayer. And they always do this before some important event in the congregation's life. Um, it was also common for pastors to do this at certain stages in their life. So, for example, uh, uh, I think, yes, it was, I forget where, it was, Malaysia or uh, in somewhere else? I think it was Malaysia. Uh, before the ordination of somebody, they, you know, the, the night or a night before their ordination, they would spend the whole night in prayer vigil. Is that, uh, does that, uh, is that a custom that you're used to at all? In some congregations. In some congregations. Okay. Prayer vigil. Yes. Another one is the, um, the church on top of Paris. The, the order of nuns there has been praying um, continuously for 150 years. Yes. All so night, all day, there's always someone There's praying. always somebody praying. And that was one of the things of certain um, orders. I mean, orders, there's certain orders whose basic task is to pray and to pray without ceasing. That's not individually, but communally, uh, in shifts. I've seen that even on parishes then, yes. individual, having families just nominated for an hour, and such and such family, and, um, and then so everyone's open the whole time, but yes. so you know you've got someone there, mm -hmm. uh, each family down for an hour, and it, and it, and it can go on there. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, some of the churches up in Toowoomba do what they call the 24-7, uh, once a year for a few years back. Yes. For a whole week. You, you're somebody praying. Okay, that's, and that's a variation on this. Not just all day, but then all night as well. Murray? Um, I've had occasion where I've sort of spent a night awake and just used the time to pray. Yes. And I've noticed that um, when that's happened, your natural thought would be that you're going to wake up extremely tired. And yes. Pain, but you actually wake up feeling quite refreshed. And that's the funny part about it. If, yes. Uh, if you spend a night in meditation prayer, you get as much rest as if you found asleep. But take notice too, the thing that I would like to pick up from that is that this, all not only, this doesn't just happen when you set out to do it. But watch out, the Holy Spirit will at certain times in your life keep you awake. Why? Because he wants you to pray for somebody or something. And it's not just a case of normal insomnia. It's different to normal insomnia. You know that. It's being kept awake for a purpose. Um, it's, it can be for a period during the night, or it can be a whole night, like what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, just you first, you second. Yes. In the Anglican Church in Melbourne, we had prayer vigils four times a year. We had four hours, six hour, 12 hour, and then all through the night. And, and we, it was a church of like hundreds and hundreds of quite young people my age, yes. and I was surprised, overwhelmed almost, by the willingness and desire yes. to actually be involved. Yes. Lots of people were willing to come and spend a night in the church. Yes. It surprised me. I didn't, yes. didn't expect that they would, but yeah, yeah. it turned out. Uh, the instinctively, people sense that there's something very important and profound uh, about this. Um, uh, anything else? Oh yes, Hans, before I go. Yes. Uh, two things. One thing is that in, in our seminary life we have students where um, once a year we would spend the whole night and praying for different topics. Yes. Uh, and also the other thing when you were sharing about Holy Spirit, um, sometimes when we prepare for sermon and next day you know you're going to preach, the whole night sometimes you're filled with the Spirit. Yes. Where you know, a lot of things are revealed from the text. You could see God just leading you through that word. Yes. And then when I get up in the morning, I still feel fresh and I'm able to put those thoughts in. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what you need to be aware of is that God will do uh, 
number one, God will use your sleep to do some of his most significant work in your life and bring things to you and give things to you. Not daytime, but nighttime. And secondly, um, and I'm going to talk about this later on, of course, when we talk about prayer, uh, you'll be called to do sentry duty for other people who are under attack at night time. The normal time that people come under spiritual attack is during the witching hours at night. Um, and what happens uh, very, very frequently, and I've, I've, it's interesting, since I've been teaching this, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of stories, cases of this, um, uh, being awakened at night time and have the burden of somebody in your head and you pray for them. Okay, let's go on. There's a lot of stuff here. Far-reaching consequences. Can you turn now next, Damien, please, to Luke chapter uh, 18, verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them, that man always ought to pray and not lose heart. Okay, and then this is the parable of the widow who keeps pestering the judge. Now notice the phrase there. Um, uh, 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 could you read in that NIV translation, please, Josh? CSV. CSV will do. Oh, could you? Yes. Just first one. Yes. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. They should always pray. The term is even stronger than should. They must always pray and not give up. Always ought. What? Ought. ought. It's yes, it's 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 obligation. Now, the term always, I think, is a little bit misleading. It's pantote which can be always, but it, it translates in the Septuagint the Hebrew adverb tamid, which is the term used for the regular sacrifices, morning and evening. So praise, pray always doesn't mean continually without ceasing, but it means regularly. And what's, uh, if you see behind pot, pantota, that's the Greek word that's used in Septuagint for tamid, it means praying when? Each morning and evening. Now notice, Jesus tells his disciples that it, this is not an option, but it's a command. They are to pray regularly. That's their duty, that's their obligation. Now, um, the church, at least the early church, took that seriously and said, OK, we are called to pray. Not just Sundays, but regularly, morning and evening. Yes? It was only in connection with this idea of prayer vigils that something clicked with me about the, the night in Gethsemane. Yes. So when the disciples were, can't you even pray for one hour? Yes. And uh, I'd never... Okay, now notice too, because that's a classical prayer vigil, the night in Gethsemane, and remember what Jesus says, watch and pray, watch means stay awake, and pray that you do not enter into temptation. Um, if you are confronted with issues involving temptation, demonic attack on yourself or others, what's the best way of dealing with that? Stay awake and pray. Full prayer. doesn't mean you pray all the time, but stay awake uh, with a focus on prayer. Uh, how did Jesus prepare for that central event in his life, his death? I would have thought he would have got as much sleep as possible to get all his strength up. He stayed awake all night in prayer. And his one prayer was, your will be done. Uh, his acceptance of the Father's will, yes? And if you read that um, sort of look, just at face value, you'd, you'd expect his prayer to have absolutely completely drained him because he's, yes. uh, he sweated. He sweated blood. blood. Yeah. Um, and remember, it's the story of the angel coming and uh, strengthening him. Yeah. Um, 
which is another interesting thing, and Luke adds that, Luke adds that one, um, because it's, the implication is there, it's not only Jesus who's strengthened in a prayer vigil, but what happens in a prayer vigil? Yeah. We are surrounded by the angels and they strengthen us uh, for a task that we're called to do, if it's a, an important task that lies ahead. Uh, okay, now, uh, what's interesting is, so Jesus has regular prayer. The two times, morning and evening, that's his regular thing. Occasionally, a whole night vigil, like the calling of the disciples, and then Gethsemane, an all night vigil, Jesus. Now, uh, uh, I find this surprising because if Jesus is God, I would expect that he doesn't have any need to pray. Now, if Jesus prays, even though he's God, how much more do we need to pray? as human beings. Um, and uh, it's, he sees it as a natural expression. So the ministry of Jesus has two sides to it. There's his ministry of word and deed. That's what we heal about most of the time. But what's the hidden side to Jesus' ministry? His meditation and prayer. You can see Jesus speaks about that most of all in John's Gospel because in John's Gospel he says, I don't speak my own words, I speak my Father's word. What I hear my Father say, I tell you. The things I see from my Father, I hand on to you. Which indicates this uh, prayer life of Jesus. So in and through this he receives from the Father what he hands on than in his public ministry. And in this way, Jesus patterns and models our own life as Christians. We receive in prayer and meditation the things then that we hand on in the work, our vocation. Now you'll see that this is obviously carried on in the early church. Um, Let's just have a look at uh, uh, three little snapshots. Three out of uh, a number of them. Uh, who's next? Okay, Nathan, can you read those three passages? First of all, go to the end of Luke's Gospel, the Ascension of Jesus. Um, to get the whole context there, can you read from 50 uh, through to 53? When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them, taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Now notice that word continually at the temple, praising God. They obviously didn't stay there uninterruptedly because they weren't there night time. Now the word for continually is a variant on this. Diapantos. It's the alternate way of translating this in the Septuagint. Diapantos, so they were, what does it mean they were diapantos at the temple praising God? Through all times. Not through all times, they weren't there uninterruptedly. According to Diapantos, Tamid, when were they at the temple? At the time of the morning sacrifice and the time of the evening sacrifice. Every morning, every evening for a period of time. Okay? They were there regularly. At the regular times of prayer. Morning and evening. That's what it means. Um, now notice here the emphasis is not just on prayer but on praise. Uh, you get the same word being used in Hebrews. Uh, can you read Hebrews 13, verse 15? Please, Nathan. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Now, the fruit of lips that confess his name is an allusion to the Shema. 
the lips that confess the holy name of God. No? Shema. Uh, notice, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God, that's the Father, a sacrifice or an offering of what? Praise. Now, praise is the fruit, the result or the outcome of lips that confess the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, what I'm interested there is continually. Now, uh, Hebrews isn't saying that you know we, we uh, praise God without ceasing all day and all night. What does he mean? The term that he uses there is diapantos, which means regularly. Morning and evening, we have a time in which we confess the name of God and we praise God. So there's daily prayer and praise, regular prayer and praise, that's assumed here in this passage. So much so that there's no explain explaining is required because everybody uh, would automatically understand what's going on. Now, you can see the same thing at the beginning of every single letter of Paul except one. Can we just go to one letter of Paul, Nathan, and read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. But I could go to any one of them. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 4. And see if you can work out the significant adverb here in this, please. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Can you see what's significant here is the adverb always, which is this one. What's Paul saying? Every morning, every evening, when he has his daily devotions, he does what? He thanks God for the Christians in Corinth. He remembers them and he thanks God for them. Now what's funny is that if there's any congregation that was a troublesome one for Paul, it was Corinth. And yet, every morning, every evening, he thanks God for these troublemakers, um, these so-and-sos. Uh, now, what uh, you'll find every letter of Paul, except the letter to the Galatians, begins with a, uh, a little phrase in which Paul says that he remembers or prays for or thanks God for um, the the people that he's writing to, and he always uses this adverb um, regularly, and that indicates then that Paul has a pattern of what? Regular prayer, daily prayer. Um, can you go to 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10, please, Josh, and there you see it spelled out um, what he means by uh, always, regularly. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. Um, as we pray most earnestly... Yeah, just do, look, get the lead in there in that translation. Thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. When do we pray? night and day, evening and morning. And notice the we indicates, uh, go back to the beginning of the letter, uh, read the opening phrase at the beginning of the letter, chapter 1. Right oh, now, can you see Paul has a prayer time together with his ministry team. He writes this letter together with Silas, Silvanus and Timothy. They are his fellow pastors. So every morning, every evening, they pray together. And you can see this is just made in passing. So it's not just by himself, but together with his fellow pastors, he prays. Um, and you can see then in the book of Acts how, uh, uh, you know, what's meant then by regular prayer. Uh, uh, can we read these passages, please? Uh, who's next? For the, those three passages from Acts which touch on the regular times of prayer. First of all, Acts 2, verse 15. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. Now, notice that's Pentecost. Um, uh, when did the Holy Spirit come? 
third of the hour of the day. And if you read uh, the chapter one, the 120 people, the core group of disciples, used to meet for prayer, daily prayer. As they were praying, third of the day, which is that morning sacrifice, morning prayer, the Holy Spirit comes on them. But take notice the coming of the Spirit connects with the, that hour of prayer. Can you go to the second one? Chapter 10, verse 9. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Righto. Sixth hour is midday. Um, which indicates, you know, this just said in passing here, uh, indicating that Pe Peter, you know, quite often, whether it was every day, we don't know, used to pray at midday. Um, and then go back to chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour of the hour of prayer. Ninth hour in the afternoon, the hour of evening prayer. Um, so, uh, uh, not only does Jesus continue the Jewish custom of praying two times a day or three times a day, but that's carried over across by the apostles at least two times a day and in the early church. And you can see that even beyond that to the Didache. Now, I don't know whether you remember the Didache from early church history. It's a little handbook on church planting. Uh, a very practical manual for discipling people and planting congregations. Very practical book, an amazing little text. And it's very, very early. It's written sometime between 90 and 110 BC, AD. It, some scholars even say it's earlier than that, which makes this very close to the last books of the New Testament. 90 AD? Okay, very close to the last books. Uh, there you get the simple instruction, you know, if you're discipling people, what you do, teach them. You teach them to pray, how many times a day? Three times a day. And what do they use to pray three times a day? The Lord's Prayer. Now take notice there, already as early, say, as 90 AD, lay people were encouraged to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Three times a day, in the morning meal, midday, and then evening before they went to bed. Prayer three times a day. And you can see that running all the way then through the early church, in the church orders, it was taken for granted. Um, so when you catechize somebody, a pagan person, what's one of the things you taught them? Not just the theory about the faith, you taught them how to pray and when to pray uh, and the importance of prayer. So you didn't just teach them about the Lord's Prayer, and, but you also showed them to use the Lord's Prayer then uh, every day. Notice the Lord's Prayer, as it were, takes the place of the Shema. So the Lord's Prayer replaces the Jewish Shema as that which is prayed three times a day. Remember that by this time, 90 AD, the Shema would have been accompanied with the 18 benedictions. And the Shema. 18 benedictions. By the way, if you're interested, look at the 18 benedictions and have the Lord's Prayer next to you and you can see the influences. Lord's Prayer, 18 benedictions, Lord's Prayer. Uh, it obviously... Jesus had those 18 benedictions in mind when he prayed and made the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, let me finish this. Um, coming out of the early church, you had three different customs. The, most, the strongest one was the lay custom of prayer three times a day, family prayer three times a day. And that family prayer was the Lord's Prayer. As well as that, you'll find from the Didache that right from the beginning, Christians were taught to say grace before and after meals. So grace with meals, Lord's Prayer. Daily family stuff. Then you had the second tradition, which scholars call the cathedral tr tradition, um, which is what Christians would do who lived in community. 
with each other, not family stuff. Let's say you had a congregation where you had three or four pastors. What would they do? They would say prayers together twice a day, morning and evening. Now, out of that cathedral tradition, which is Christian community tradition, you get uh, the tradition of praying matins and vespers. That's where we get our service of matins and vespers. Um, matins is morning prayer and praise. Vespers is evening prayer and praise. And what those services focus on is the Lord's Prayer and the saying of Psalms. That's the center of Matins and Vespers, is the singing, the saying, the reciting, or the chanting, however you did it, of Psalms, together with the Lord's Prayer, and in some occasions also the Creed, but that was the heart of it. There's a third tradition, which is very late. So you had family prayer very early. You have this community prayer, beginning with Paul's ministry team and then leading to that cathedral tradition, community tradition, very early too. Then with the growth of the monastic movement, you had a third tradition developing and um, you, we find traces of it from about 400 AD onwards. In monastic communities, they picked up that phrase from Psalm 119 about praying, no, praising God seven times a day or praising God continually or regularly. And since they were in community, they could praise God 24 hours a day. And even if they couldn't pray and praise 24 hours a day, they punctuated the day with seven hours of prayer. And from that, you get what is now called the daily office. The daily office, which is daily prayer, which is very, very important for the monastic tradition and the Catholic tradition, um, particularly Catholic tradition then of priests. Priests are required to say the daily office. Now, what does the daily office consist of? There's seven times of prayer. There's lords, which is at the uh, first light, dawn, not sunrise, but at dawn, then you get prime, which is the first hour of the day, sunrise, and the focus on prime is on the resurrection of Jesus. Um, then there's terse, which is nine, the third hour, nine o'clock in the morning. The focus there is on the crucifixion of Jesus, because Jesus was crucified on the third hour, but also the third hour is the time that the Holy Spirit was given. So the focus there is on the crucifixion of Jesus in order to give us the Holy Spirit. Third hour of the day. Uh, sext is midday. Um, and that's the time when the darkness begins, which lasts three hours. God forsaken. Being forsaken by God. The three hours of darkness. Noon. Um, and paradoxically... No, the darkness is at the brightest time of the day. And then there is uh, uh, the, the next hour of prayer is uh, known, which means nine, the ninth hour, which, which commemorates the death of Jesus. Then Vespers occurs, guess what time of the day? At sunset. You know, you don't have clocks, so it occurs at sunset. Vespers means uh, no, evening prayer. Matins means morning prayer. Vespers, evening prayer. And then you have compline. Compline is prayers said before going to bed. And what's remembered in compline is our own death. If, and the prayers around compline see every evening going to bed as a rehearsal for our final sleep and our final rest in death. You have... Hmm? Great thought to go to bed. It's a great thought. It's one of the most beautiful. Do you know Compline at all, the order of Compline? It's a beautiful order. It really is beautiful. Um, and if you want an evening, uh, a pattern of evening prayer, there's some lovely stuff there. Yes? Um, I've always been curious whether this works like up north in Scandinavia and where you get the, the funny daylight. 
<laughs> you mean right up in the Arctic Circle? Well, even, even in Sweden, they have parts of the year where there's like, you know, only a few hours of uh, Yeah, um, uh, I, I, it's something I've tried to that discover too. Um, what I have not found out is that there's special um, notices given in monastic texts of what to do in winter time, even in northern England and uh, North Germany and, pla and, and, and Finland, places like that. Uh, uh, and there were various ways in which they adapted it. In some cases, they ran stuff together. Um, so up, up in, I know, North England, you, you, you run together uh, the first two, you run together uh, the last two because the day is so short. Yes? Yeah, just in um, at Tarawara Abbey, even in the Cistercian way, in yeah. the Yarra Valley, they have, they change it a bit too. Like they have, I think it's known as at 1.40. Yes. And they have vestas around 4 o'clock. Yes. 4.30. So it gives them a, a oh no, maybe it's a bit later, even. they try and get a bit more time then. Because else you can't go out on the farm. I'm yes. not talking about trying to paint the house. Yes. You just get all your brushes out. And, and then you go back. Scaffolding. It's time to start washing them and cleaning up. You know, you paint a few strokes, time to clean up. Yes. So they change that a bit. But also then on their schedule, that they, they have a fixed times, but they change maybe in two two or three times of the year. It'll yes. say from this month to this month. Yes. This is the schedule for prayer. Yes. And they change it and, um, according, to, yeah, according to the length yes. of the day. As you can see, this was not designed for uh, a north, you know, extremes north and south. This is Mediterranean uh, climate. Yeah, there's practical problems here. Let's have a break, and then I want to uh, uh, carry.